Uh, all you dear viewers out there who uh, join us week by week, I don't know if I've ever mentioned this, but one of the real joys that we've had in our church family here in Windsor uh, during the course of the past year is the arrival of quite a few newcomers from China. And uh, several of them uh, already spoke uh, their vows of faith and love in public last Advent and were received here by adult confirmation. And this weekend, we're going to receive a number more uh, by adult baptism, by adult confirmation, and also by child baptism. I can't neglect to really uh, express my personal appreciation to my wonderful friend, Pastor Torgerson, uh, who has spent so many hours uh, uh, instructing and uh, preparing these folks for church membership. And they've been a real encouragement, I think, and a good example to our people and those of us who've confessed Christ for a long time uh, by their devotion and their steadiness at worship and study. In any event, it's probably uh, fitting then uh, that this week's epistle happens to talk about faith uh, and the word uh, that brings faith into the hearts of people. Uh, and we're so glad to have you with us uh, for this hour of word and prayer and song. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us pray. Almighty and merciful God, by your gift alone, your faithful people render true and laudable service. So help us steadfastly to live in this life according to your promises, and finally attain your heavenly glory through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. 
The epistle for this now, which is the 12th Sunday after Trinity, is recorded in St. Paul's letter to the Romans, chapter 10. And a portion of this reading serves as the basis for the preaching today. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. For the scripture says everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. The same Lord is Lord of all, bestowing his riches on all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. But how are they to call on him in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him of whom they've never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. But they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed what he has heard from us? So faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Holy Gospel according to St. Mark in the seventh chapter. Jesus returned from the region of Tyre and went through Sidon to the Sea of Galilee in the region of the Decapolis. And they brought to him a man who was deaf and had a speech impediment. And they begged him to lay his hand on him. And taking him aside from the crowd privately, he put his fingers into his ears and after spitting, touched his tongue. And looking up to heaven, he sighed and said to him, Ephatha, that is, be open. And his ears were open. His tongue was released and he spoke plainly. And Jesus charged them to tell no one. But the more he charged them, the more zealously they proclaimed it. And they were astonished beyond measure, saying, He has done all things well. He even makes the deaf hear and the mute speak. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And now in the words of the Nicene Creed, we confess our holy faith together. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. And the third day he rose again according to the scriptures and ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of the Father. And he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshiped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church, I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Amen.
May God pour out upon every single one of you much grace and peace in the knowledge of him and of his son Christ Jesus the Lord. As I mentioned, we're going to focus on the epistle that was read just a minute ago from Romans in the 10th chapter. And that reading concludes like this, Consequently, faith comes from hearing the message, and the message is heard through the word of Christ. Now let's pray. Lord, set our feet on solid ground and let your words go with us in all our ways. From the rising of the sun to the place where it sets, may your name, O Lord, be praised. Amen. In Christ the Lord, my dear treasured friends, one and all of you, it happened November 18th. 1978 in a forest in Guyana in South America 914 bodies were found including 200 children who had either committed suicide by drinking poisoned Kool-Aid or who had been shot they were members of a church called the People's Temple and they had destroyed themselves on order from their pastor, the Reverend Jim Jones. A few of you older types listening to me now may actually recall those news reports from nearly 45 years ago. Some younger ones who are listening today might not have ever heard of this at all. You can describe that event in a great many ways. Tragic, chilling. But whatever else you and I might say about it, it is far from the goal that God's loving Son had for all of those people. I will build my church. That's what Jesus wants. And things go crooked whenever God's people lose sight of that. It's true they might not go off the track quite so dramatically as the story of 914 people destroying themselves in a jungle, but go off the track they will. When Jesus Christ says, I will build my church, it's perfectly obvious that faith is his goal for people. And if faith is the goal, then Christ's word is the means. Now when Jesus said, I will build my church, he was talking about planting faith in human hearts like yours. The Bible stresses that goal, and it came out in today's epistle. If you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. So that's how you get hooked up to Jesus Christ. 
And that's how you get included in the company of people who belong to Jesus Christ for real. It happens through faith. Faith is Jesus' goal for us. That's why he asked one time, you can read it in the Gospels, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? That's what he's going to be looking for. Human beings, of course, can pursue a thousand different goals in life. But when Jesus Christ returns, he will be looking for faith. That's his goal for you. You can, of course, crowd out his goal with many goals of your own choosing. And it's not only unbelievers who do that. Church people do it all the time. And so, sad to say, do some preachers. The Reverend Jim Jones pastored his congregation for years in Indianapolis, Indiana. He was recognized by a Christian denomination, not by some cult. But somewhere along the line, it became his goal to control the people under his care. The story goes that one Sunday during the service, he actually took a Bible in his hand and cast it to the floor and said to the congregation, God reveals truth through me. He got most of the members to relocate, first of all to California and later to an isolated spot in South America so he could insulate them against outside influences. When a United States congressman traveled to Guyana to investigate what was happening, and some of the members of that church attempted to leave with that congressman, they were murdered on an airfield under orders from the pastor. The goal was personal control, and those were some of the means he used to pursue that goal. I, as a pastor, alternatively, might decide that the big goal around here should be peace at all costs. I don't want people to ever struggle with each other. Above all, I really want them to like me. So to reach that goal, I may do nothing other than tell cute stories that will have the effect of sort of soothing and flattering everybody. I may muffle God's word when it speaks against sin, when it calls men and women to repent and to a life that looks different from the life of the unbelieving world around us. Christian parents may zero in sometimes on goals of their own choosing, whether they always admit that fact to themselves or not. They may decide that the big objective is not faith, it's keeping my kid happy. So I shy away from shaping my child, let's say, to take responsibility or to serve others or to do the right thing, especially when that's not easy. In the spiritual shaping of that child, I may decide, well, it doesn't matter all that much what he or she is told or taught, as long as my child never gets bored and thoroughly enjoys the experience. By the way, that's not just a danger for young parents and children either. Longtime elderly believers, without realizing it, may zero in on a goal other than faith. They may think that the main objective is that I should always feel unruffled. And so in God's church, absolutely every detail has to be exactly the way it was 50 years ago. Even if some of the new things I don't like are rooted in the Bible and would proclaim the truth of Christ quite clearly. Faith must be the goal. That is Jesus' goal for people. And you and I do well to embrace it as our own goal once again today. Whether you faced it or not, it is the most crucial thing in your personal life. When Christ comes and you stand before him, he's not going to pay a whole lot of attention to how popular you were personally. He's not going to care all that much whether your house and the lawn out in front of it were the envy of the block. Whether your business ventures always ended in financial success is not going to be at the top of his agenda. When the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? That's what he's going to want to know about you. Is faith there? And I don't just mean talking about faith. Is faith there? When the Son of Man comes furthermore, He's not going to go knocking on the door of our church office and ask our secretary to uh, furnish him with statistical reports. He's not going to care overly much whether our finances always met the budget. He won't look primarily at the condition of this building and the grounds. He won't decide that all was well just because we managed to avoid every possible struggle and controversy. When the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth, he asks. That's got to be our first concern as a Christian congregation, that faith be planted in the hearts of people. Now you may reply to that, well, 
All that goes without saying. I'm here to tell you, it must not go without saying. Husbands and wives, for example, can think, yes, we love each other, and that goes without saying. But it shouldn't go without saying, should it? That's because it's nurturing and it's strengthening to be told something that you already know and have already heard, in this case, namely, that you're loved. In the same way, it is vital for individual believers and for an entire church family like ours to say it consciously. Faith must be the goal. It should not go without saying, lest that fact get muddled and somehow lost. It's vital to keep this particular goal sharp and clear. Faith is the goal. If that's true, then the word of Christ is the means toward that goal. Our text puts the goal in very clear words. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Jesus wants people to call on him, not in any vague way, but actually desperately reaching out to him for help. Imagine you would have been one of those people who survived the sinking of the Titanic over a hundred years ago, and now you're floating around on one of those little round lifesavers, you know, in the freezing waters of the North Atlantic. You know very well as you float there that you haven't got very long. If a lifeboat rows past, you're not going to call out with a vague kind of greeting, you know, hi, how are you this evening? No, you're going to scream the words in a very potent way, save me, because you realize there's no other rescue, and you're looking to that boat to provide it for you. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. That's the call Jesus loves to hear. It is the call of faith. It's the call that's full of confidence that he can bring you the help you need. You know, during my 42 years of marriage, I've developed great confidence in my wife. And it's interesting, never once that I recall anyway, did she ever sit down and command me that I had to have confidence in her. She simply did the kind of things that gave me confidence. She tells me the truth, even sometimes when it's hard to hear. She doesn't promise everything, but she tries hard to keep the promises she does make. She shifted her own comfort many times into second place in order to do the right thing for our four children and for me. So I gained confidence in her because she has said and done so many things that engender that confidence. Jesus Christ, likewise, doesn't just sit you down and command you, have faith, but he came down to earth from heaven as God's man to give you cause and reason to set your confidence and faith and hope on him. In all his words and thoughts, he glorified his Father, and he showed bottomless love for the fallen human race. He took our failures onto his own back and then carried that burden up to that rocky spot on the hilltop outside of Jerusalem. There he let violent men nail him tight to a piece of wood. He poured out innocent blood there and gave his life, as he said, as a ransom for many, many people. You can trust Jesus Christ for everything, when you need somebody to forgive the guilt of your sins, Jesus Christ is right there. When you need the only one who can help you break free and overcome the grip that sin tries to exert many times in your life, Jesus Christ is all yours. When you need help to face even your own death with composure and calmness, Jesus Christ is your man. When you need the only one who can take a blurred life and get things back into focus again, Jesus Christ says, whoever comes to me, I will never cast out, never. Jesus wants people to have faith and to call upon him. And he has done everything that you'd ever need him to do to generate that faith. Now, how does God bring Jesus close to you so that you'll get to know him well enough for all of that to happen? Our text asked that question, didn't it? How can people call on the one they have not believed in? And how can people believe in the one of whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without somebody preaching to them? And how can anybody preach without being sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. So see, those questions actually provide the answer. The same Jesus who once walked on dusty roads and preached in person, is now doing it through his heralds. Those heralds 
And I humbly tell you, I'm honored to be one of them. They're under orders to tell you what the king wants you to have. It's not my job to give book reports here, even though I've read a few books over the years and perhaps would be in a position to do that. I'm not a herald if I go around just spouting my opinions about the state of politics in Canada or provide information on the latest fashion trends or diet strategies. What makes me a herald is that I'm here to bring messages from your gracious king. The good news ultimately comes from him and the good news is about him. The good news is not just a little bit of religious information so that you'll leave the church service at the end and know a few more facts than you did when you first came in. The good news, and we call it gospel, creates faith and keeps it alive in your heart and mind. The word from Christ, the word about Christ, that's the means that we use to reach this goal of getting faith into the hearts of men and women. If the goal were personal control, I guess I'd seek ways to intimidate and pressure you the way Jim Jones did. If the goal were popularity, maybe I'd be mostly concerned to entertain and flatter you. If the goal is keeping children happy no matter what, then I guess you'll look for whatever gimmicks they want to hear and see. If the goal, on the other hand, is just maintaining ancient customs, then I guess your methods could be a good dose of stubbornness and a refusal to budge no matter what. But if the goal is faith, then the means is the word of Christ. And Paul said that right here, didn't he? In verse 17, faith comes from hearing the message and the message is heard through the word of Christ. That provides very clear insight, doesn't it? It gives real direction, both to preachers and to hearers. The Christian church on earth today is in desperate need of pastors who are going to see their task primarily as heralds to bring the word of Christ to people. The apostle put that so well in his first letter to the Corinthians when he said, while I was with you, I was determined to know nothing except Jesus Christ and him nailed to a cross. It could be tempting, you see, for preachers to put a wet finger to the wind, if I could express it like that, and do market surveys and find out what people want and create successful religious organizations that are very popular. It's tempting to want to kind of dumb down the content of the Christian faith and to simply say God loves you in some vague and mushy way so that people get the idea that it doesn't really matter all that much what you believe as long as you believe in something. The apostles of Jesus never did it that way. They were heralds of great integrity. They were always proclaiming Christ, Christ crucified, Christ raised from the dead, Christ ruling on high, Christ interceding for us, Christ coming again in glory. They told budding young preachers like Timothy, preach the word, be prepared in season and out of season. In other words, when it's popular and when it isn't. Correct, rebuke and encourage with great patience and careful instruction. If faith is the goal, and if Christ's word is the means to that goal, that gives direction to you hearers also. You know why I really want to see worshipers in person, in God's house, every Lord's day, unless you're really kept away by absolute necessity? It's not just because of statistics or because of somehow my own sake. It's because faith comes from hearing the message. You think about that. You know, the Holy Spirit could have dictated the apostle to write here, well, faith comes from reading the message. After all, Bible reading is a good habit, and I hope you practice it. But you often may have had the same experience that I had as a young adult Christian when the faith first became meaningful to me when I would sit down at home with my own Bible. I didn't draw nearly as much out of it as when Pastor Roschke would stand up on Sunday morning and really unpack it for us in preaching and teaching. At times you might feel, as I did in those days, or the way that eunuch felt, you know, from Ethiopia. You can read about him in Acts chapter 8, when he was reading the Bible, and St. Philip asked him, Do you understand what you are reading? The guy answered Philip totally honestly, How can I, unless somebody explains it to me? The first Christian congregation lived that way too, didn't it? It says they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, and to the fellowship. So they didn't merely sit down 
and at home read documents that the apostles sent them in the mail. They got together with other believers to hear the living voice of those heralds bringing them the word of Christ. Faith comes from hearing the message and the message is heard through the word of Christ. As a young Christian student, I lived for those Sunday mornings when I could go and hear the real Jesus tell me through a real voice that I could really hear, I will give you rest. And now, decades later, as an aging herald, I live for those moments when I can stand up in a public place like this and say to anybody who's willing to listen, God's Son has set you free. If faith is the goal, that needs to be the heart of what preachers do. If faith is the goal, that needs to be at the heart of what listeners live for. When the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? Jesus asked. It's a very haunting question, and it has punch in it to help you put your own current priorities into perspective. It also helps our church's teaching and preaching priorities to get into perspective. In almost unbelievable mercy, God has given you the man Jesus Christ so that faith could be engendered in human hearts like yours. And he has also given the message that brings this Christ today right close to where you are. If faith is the goal, then Christ's word is the means. How's that for a clear priority? It comes to you straight from the one who long ago said, I will build my church. Amen. May the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. Now let's pray. O oh, blessed God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, in obedience to your command and comforted by your promise to hear, we bring our prayers to you as our spiritual sacrifice. Let those prayers be acceptable in your sight for the sake of your servant Jesus. Protect and strengthen your Christian church and all your believing people throughout the world. Help us faithfully to testify to the salvation won by your Christ and draw your children close to each other in words and actions of genuine love. Give wisdom to those who rule our land and in far-flung nations. Shape leaders everywhere who govern with truth and honest concern for the citizens. Bless those working to bring aid to areas in the world suffering from drought and famine. Help all now battling the widespread fires in Canada's north and strengthen the defenders of Ukraine and make an end to the ravaging war in their country. Help refugees and displaced families to find a settled home. Grant guidance to mothers and fathers caring for children. Move Christian parents, dear Lord, to honor the promises made at their baptisms, to root them in the word and worship of Jesus. And let the parents themselves be faithful in coming to your house and your table, so that their children may see in a genuine way a faith that goes beyond mere words. Stand beside your people enduring personal trouble today for whatever reason, whether there's illness in their bodies, worry over their loved ones, fear because of the rising cost of many things, or struggles with depression. Take pity on all of them in their needs. Send kind people their way to support them and assure them that you are always near. Bless the wonderful newcomers from China who speak their vows of faith at our altar this Sunday and are received into fellowship. Let their devoted lives be a correcting reminder to us who have confessed Christ for years. Let our family of faith embrace them in love. All these things, O Lord, and everything else you see we need, grant us for the sake of Christ, in whose name we pray with confidence. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, 
Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. Now receive the benediction of the Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up the light of his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. <laughs>